Welcome back, Microsoft Virtual Academy, Security Fundamentals, Module 3, Understanding Security Policies uh, for Exam 98367. That's a good intro. I was actually sitting there, I was going to sit there silently and see if you picked up the intro, or if we just sat here in silence waiting for a second. No, I'm... I just I'm, picked that right up. We're, we're a team. Well, I know. Christopher, we are, in fact, we're a solid team. Okay. In, fact, being, in fact, speaking of solid team, Christopher Chapman... How's it going? Thomas Willingham, we are here to facilitate security fundamentals knowledge for you, the audience. It is. Facilitate. That's a good word. Yeah. Pour upon. Deluge. Deluge. There you go. Depending on the module. This one, <laughs> uh, relatively decent. This one should be a little lighter than... Yeah. Yeah, the, then, the, then the next one's coming up. Yes. We'll yeah. warn you ahead of but, time. But still exciting. Still exciting. We've got some good demos coming up. And yeah, we've got some good stuff coming up. Mm -hmm. Module overview. We'll talk about common password attacks and password policies. And we have some demos. Christopher has some demos for you. So should be pretty good to go. Common password attacks. So we have dictionary and brute force attacks. A dictionary attack is a, an attack containing an extensive list of potential passwords. The attacker then uses those words to just cycle through and see if the passwords match the user ID. Uh, more crude form of attack is to just use, and this is referred to as a brute force attack, is to just use start with random key combinations and just go all the way through. Like the whole monkey typing, the, uh, the works novel. works of Shakespeare, something Yeah, like the that. works yeah. of Shakespeare, yeah. Uh, so kind of a, the monkey typing works of Shakespeare password attack. Sort of. I think that sounds a little that more. It's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah, a little more exciting. Now, there is one in here that they oh. don't mention. Yes. What is it? Any thoughts on any other types of password attacks that aren't mentioned on this slide? Dictionary, brute force. Think less technical. Um, uh, social engineering, where you look That's over the their, where you're looking over their shoulder. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and then the other is, oh, Christopher, I know you are like totally in love with your little Chihuahua Bella, so I'm sure your password is Bella. Let's try that real quick. He doesn't have a pet Chihuahua, and it's not named Bella. That's an example. But it's it is what it's could a, be a good. That one's actually kind of halfway between dictionary and social engineering. Because you're using preset words that pertain to things you know about a person that may be a password. Yeah, or maybe, uh, oh, Christopher could be a football enthusiast, uh, and maybe his favorite team is the Seahawks, and due to the fact that the Seahawks just won the Super Bowl, uh, maybe his password is Seahawks. So again, kind of that whole... Notice how I got the Super Bowl in there? Yeah, that was actually was to... pretty impressive, yeah. <laughs> so now my password is Seahawks win. But Winning. That, that is neither here nor there. That is, it is a good, what they don't put on that slide is that social engineering aspect that can actually be combined with the, at least one of the others, the dictionary, to, um, to I don't want to say to successfully guess passwords, but to, to increase the odds of finding a password. So physical attacks, we're not talking about somebody all ninja style jumping out and beating on your computer. Anytime your computer can be physically attacked or physically <laughs> accessed, I'm, I'm thinking attack now, uh, by an attacker, that computer's at risk. Uh, they can bypass any form of network security and now they have local access. Local access could include things like a key logger where they install a key logger on your system and basically what a keylogger is, is now anything that you type on the computer is buffered into a file, at which point they, uh, the attacker can come by at a later time and get that file from you. Another thing they could do is if they have physical access to your system is possibly uh, use USB and uh, put USB on your computer and possibly run an executable or something or so... You want to ensure that attackers don't have physical <laughs> access to your computer. If, and this slide also addresses the fact that if 
you have encryption software that you have to run or have to put a password in. If you put the password in and it's hit by the keylogger, now they have the password for your encryption system. So ensure that uh, people don't have physical access to your systems. Now again, this goes back to you need to have the appropriate level of security for uh, the data that you that you have. You don't need five star security on a scale of one to five uh, for pictures of your dog or cat. I feel like these modules may end up leading to somebody out there learning a lot about security, getting into IT for a while, and then starting a company called Five Star Security. I feel like, I like that, it. Might, that might just I, happen. That could be a thing. It probably is already that, somewhere. That could be a thing. Network sniffers. In the networking fundamentals course, when we talk about network traffic, computers on a network, accessing resources, when computers or devices communicate on the network, they put packets on the network to communicate with each other. They use a set of rules referred to as the OSI model to build these packets, and then they send these packets back and forth to communicate. These packets, once they're dumped on the wire, go all over the network to any computer, a computer looks at the packet and says, yes, this is for me, I'll use it. No, this isn't for me, I'll discard it. A network sniffer sits on the wire, takes all incoming packets, and basically assembles them. So you're able, as someone operating a network sniffer, to recreate entire sessions between a server and a client, or a client and a client. Well, and depending on what you're sniffing, what sessions you're looking at, what traffic you're looking at, you may not even need to see whole sessions. You may just get a password. Correct. It's correct. It's just a packet that's going to have a password in it, depending on a number of different criteria that we don't go into the depth of today. But I may need a sniffer just to get a password. That's it. Now, that being said, sniffers are valid forms of equipment. Uh, you may use a sniffer to test bandwidth on your system. Uh, it seems like at certain points of the, of the day, the network gets really slow. You could use a sniffer to basically figure out that some of your techs are playing online games, they're hooked playing World of Warcraft, or, or whatever. Uh, you have a server that comes online, a whole bunch of people are accessing, is accessing it for media purposes at a certain time. So a sniffer can be a useful tool, but it can be a tool used for Back to nefarious, for Malice, nefarious, yeah. nefarious purposes. Indeed. So let's talk about password policies. Password policies. Password complexity is, are the rules associated with how you're going to create your password. Uh, you see constantly people who have passwords of like one, two, three, four. Uh, they use the word password. Uh, password complexity basically enforces rules that says you need to have certain requirements in place to put in a password. So things like you need to have an uppercase letter, you need to have some lowercase letters, you need to have some numbers, you need to have some non-alpha characters. So maybe your password has an uppercase letter, some lowercase letters, uh, a number, a couple numbers, and then maybe a bang or an at sign or a hash sign uh, in there just to kind of trick things up. If people are using uh, dictionary brute force crackers, uh, this can just make it that much more difficult. Again, if somebody really wants access to your data, they'll spend enough money and they'll gain access to it. Again, what you're looking for is that an appropriate level of security that, that meets the standards for the type of data that you're working with. Well, and, and in this context, we're, we're talking about passwords, but we're kind of talking about it almost from a, a user to user standpoint, we're saying for you. Where this pertains to the overall picture of security as we see it in the Security Fundamentals MTA course is you as an administrator, potentially as a security admin or just a network administration, a network administrator on a network, are gonna have to determine these options for your network. What do you want them to see? What do you want them to be able to use? Password length, one of the things on here. So this is just password complexity. We're gonna go into more password options in a minute. 
I would say though, for anybody out there aiming to be a security admin, becoming a security admin, keep this slide handy because what we're gonna see in the demo in a couple of slides involves password complexity, but without any detailed explanation of what that means like this slide has on it. Very good. So talking about password length, there's password length, age, and history. So password length is there's minimum and maximum of how many uh, characters do you need to have in your password. And I'm sure you've all seen this if you've signed up for websites, used your passwords at work, uh, created pins for your bank cards, whatever. We've all seen must have a minimum of four or six characters, uh, a maximum of 13 to 15 characters. It, you must use some letters, you must use some numbers, uppercase and lowercase. So these are all password requirements. So password length, password age. Password age is how often do you have to reset your password? A minimum password age. So once you set your password, you must have it for at least this long versus maximum password age. After this time has expired, you must change your password. Password history is how soon can you reuse a password? So if you really like, so we talked in a different module about having a dual stage password where one part of the password is static, say underscore plant, and then the first part of the password is dynamic, say maybe a color blue, a season, a whatever. So Christopher and I, we manage a system. Uh, we know that our common password is underscore plant. We don't talk about that. I've changed the password to meet requirements and I come up to Christopher, I'm like, hey Christopher, the password now is blue. So he knows moving forward that blue underscore plant is the new password. Having a history means that you cannot reuse a password for X amount of time or X amount of passwords changed. And this relates to maximum password age. Uh, one of the sort of caveats to password management is if I'm a user and I get the little warning says, hey, your password's gonna expire in two weeks, do you wanna change it now? Regardless of whether or not I wait two weeks or do it right now. If I'm on a network with an age, say 90 days, and even a password history that says I can't use the same three, six, eight, ten passwords previous that I've used again. All I have to do is go in, change my password from what it is now to what it is now with a one at the end. And I save it, and then I log off, and then I log back on, and then I control it, delete, and I do the same thing again, but I put a two at the end. And I do that eight, nine times, however many times the history is set for, and then I can recycle back to the first password I had. I can do that all right now. Unless your minimum password age is set for a certain period of time that doesn't allow that immediate reset. Exactly, I can't change my password. If it's a 90 day max, I may not be able to change it for the first 60. Correct, correct. So there is a good interaction in there. Now, oh, it's demo time, Christopher. It is Yay, indeed. demo time. So Christopher is gonna show you oh. about view and creation of a password policy, which is what we've just talked about. Unless Christopher, he, take it away. Unless he clicks the wrong button and closes the VM that he was using. Oh, oops. In which case, no, he does not. There we go. Full screen, we are terrific. All right, password policy. This, again, is potentially a complicated topic. Of course, everything we're teaching is, so it's pretty normal. I have open, we looked at this earlier, group policy, or what's called group policy, but for the local computer, and it's actually called local computer policy, but you'll still hear the term group policy applied. In here, I can set the password policies for an individual machine. For example, I just have a server, that's all. Or even a desktop, if you wanna do this at home, not in a room or in a house with other people because you'll start changing group policies that make their computers do weird things and they might get mad at you. We'll talk about that later. In here, I can set the policies for this computer. Here are your settings. Enforce password history, 24 remembered. Maximum age, 42 days. Minimum age, one day. So I have to change it after 42. I can't change it for the first 24 hours. And a seven character minimum password length. Now, these are just for this computer. I might wanna set these policies for my entire network. And that's where group policy comes in. I go into group policy management. 
And again, we're not going to spend the depth on this that we could. I could actually probably spend an entire day talking about group policy management. Here's my domain. Here are okay. Really quick, let's let's give the audience or or the students something to think about. If local policy is based on the computer, global policy, this global group policy, you just mentioned a domain. In what structure do they think this more global group policy is held? What do you mean? Well, so we're installing this group policy that affects more than one computer. Uh -huh. So now, where do students think that that might be held? What type of structure might that be held in? Uh, I think I get what you're saying. Where do I make this available to all of those computers on my network? Correct. How do they know about this? Correct. I'm guessing someone can come up with the answer, someone watching the video, maybe? Any thoughts? Could that be Active Directory? That directory well structure, that global directory structure that multiple systems share that isn't local. So now we're talking about a more global system, Active Directory. Uh, so this information is stored in, in Active Directory to tie that back mm -hmm. in. So I have my domain. I have my default domain policy, which exists in every network right off the bat. And I can edit this individual policy. It's going to bring up the same thing we just saw the same style editor that we just saw for the local computer. The difference is you can see right at the top, default domain policy. In here, I get it expanded out. Policies, window settings, security settings. Here are the policies we're starting with. And I think our first demo specifically is on password policies, yes? Yes, correct. Uh, we're password policies, password complexity, length, age, and history. Yep, all part of the same policy, luckily. So, window settings, security settings, account policies, password policy, here are your starting points. Enforce password history, 24, same, same options we saw on the server. It's a domain controller, so they're set the same. And I, then, can you click into one of those just so they can see the option yep. box of what that, there you go. Now, one of the best things for an administrator who's new to Windows, who's new to Active Directory, who's new to group policy especially, especially group policy, is this right here. This explain tab is invaluable. A large part of why it's invaluable is that what Microsoft doesn't tell you is turning on some policies could potentially turn off an option. So there are, I, I wish I knew right off the top of my head a good example of a policy that when you enable the policy, you disable some sort of functionality. So people may get confused that they're turning on the policy, which means they're turning on that functionality. Not necessarily the case. Enabling the policy may disable something. Here I can change my, my passwords. Let's go three instead of 24. And I apply it. And this tells you the same thing. Determines the number of unique new passwords that have to be associated with a user account before an old one can be reused. And it says the value must be between zero and 24. They max it out. It's a default on a domain controller, 24. And I click OK. And I can modify all of these. They're relatively quick and easy. 42 days is insane. One day, I, if you're going to do one day, I mean, it is enough to discourage people cycling through their passwords right now. But you, know, you can set this something like 60. Minimum length is pretty straightforward. But this one, complexity requirements. It is enabled. Don't tell me anything here. Let's go to explain. This is the important part. I've had users ask me. I keep getting an error. I'm trying to reset my password. It says it doesn't meet the requirements. What are the requirements? They're on the explanation tab of the group policy for that policy itself. Password must meet complexity requirements. Six characters in length. And this is, these are detailed. Not contain the user's account name or parts of the user's full name that exceeds two consecutive characters. So if my full name is Christopher Chapman and I try and put CHR in my password, it's not going to let me do it. Six characters long at least, which means if you've got a, a minimum password length, of two characters, and you turn on complexity, you're not going to be able to do a two character password. It's not going to work. Uh, characters from three of the following four categories, English uppercase, English lowercase, base 10 digits, and special characters. What we call special characters here, they're non-alphanumeric, or non-alphabetic. And that's it. That's it for this first set. This one right here, I'm, don't even worry about that. Don't ever change that setting. 
Store passwords using reversible encryption. Yeah. Never, ever, 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 unless you have a specific, written, planned, determined, budgeted, <coughs> approved by four layers of people need, don't ever worry about storing passwords with reversible encryption. And that's it for that demo. We'll come back to this because we've got more to look at in a little while. Okay, so we've talked about password requirements, uh, age, history, complexity. Now we're going to talk about lockout. So what happens if somebody has tried to lock into your, or lock in, log into your computer and has, has failed attempts? <clears throat> so after so many failed attempts that can be set, uh, account th lockout threshold, reset account lockout counter after. So these are settings that say, hey, this is how the account is going to get locked. So after so many incorrect login attempts, your lockout duration is what? 10 minutes, an hour, four hours, whatever. Again, dependent on your environment. Account lockout lockout threshold. So how many incorrect attempts are made before it's locked out? And then reset account lockout counter after. So if you have your account lockout counter set for 24 hours, I would probably hit that. But you need to ensure that after a fresh login that gets reset, which it does, but if you're just dinking around, for how long a period of time is that going to set? Or is it going to monitor those incorrect mm -hmm. attempts? Exactly. So now we have another great demo yep. for Christopher. Uh, view and create account lockout policy. Yep. So we're going to be in the same area as we were before, just viewing a little bit different settings. And I'm actually starting on the exact same screen, just the next option, account lockout policy. Account lockout duration. This is exactly what it sounds like. Once you've locked out your account because you've tried too many times to log in unsuccessfully, how long does it stay locked out for? This long by default, 30 minutes. And again, it's all explained in the explain tab. Account lockout threshold. Now this says zero. There's, this is something to note. Not defining this means the same as defining it and setting it to zero, which means your account, there, there are no lockouts. Probably not the best bet for a domain controller, especially. So we set that to three, it locks out after three invalid attempts. And same thing here. Failed password attempts against workstations or member servers that have been locked using control, delete, or password protection screensavers count as failed logon attempts. I mean, you're, you're still trying to log on no matter what. Cancel that, and we go to reset count after. And this is exactly, again, this is one that you may have to read this a couple of times as you're setting this up to get used to it determines the number of minutes that must elapse after a failed logon attempt before the attempt counter is reset to zero. What that means is if I type in my password once and it doesn't work, and then I type it in again and it works, so I've only tried and failed once, but once it works the second time, it doesn't set it to zero automatically. There's a period of time that has to elapse, and that's what this determines. Like you said, you could set this up to a day. I mean, the maximum, you look at explain, 99,999 minutes, which means you have to, in that period of time, never fail the login three times, or your account's going to be locked out. Yeah, it'd be locked out. And then you could really mess with people and say your account lockout threshold. What's the maximum here? 999 attempts. What's the max duration? So again, so you could, you could mess with your users a little bit, maybe, if you happen to be in charge of group policy. I don't recommend that. It's what we call a uh, resume generating event. Yep. Yep. Uh, and that kind of hinders availability. Um, Confidentiality, availability, integrity, uh, that, that hampers. It potentially does, yes. Availability. That's it. That's, that's what we got for password policies. This was a quick one. For, yes. So again, microsoft.com slash learning to look at some additional resources for this course, 98367. Uh, Christopher, some other resources here? Well, I'm actually looking at the slide on our little monitor that we have here and trying to figure out why the font seems to be a different color in one of the three boxes. I don't know. I'll have to look at that. That's just weird to me. Um, the resources are great. Again, once you get into 410, I, 
I like teaching this stuff so much. Group policy is one of my favorite things in all of IT. It's, and I hate to say this because I think it's just a power thing. I can control so many things from one place for so many people in so many other places. And there's so much complexity to it. We've just shown you the sheen. It's like yes. looking at a, yeah. it's like looking at a new car from the window of the office building across the street. You can see that car. You can see it looks fast. That's about it. There's a whole world to be discovered. So, oh, 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 oh. Uh, let me let me throw out huh, a, one warning here. Uh, as you play with group policy initially as a student, uh, if you want to play with account settings, don't play with account settings on the account that you work on. Uh, create another account, create a new account, and use that as a testbed account. If you want to uh, play with settings on a server, maybe have a virtual machine yep. that you're logging into, playing with settings. Uh, group policy, you can really shoot yourself in the foot at about the head using group policy. It's a, it's a really powerful tool, but you can really mess things up well, with I, group policy also. I have a good example of that when I was younger, when I was new to this, when I was learning these things myself. I lived with another, I had a roommate at the time, and we were both in IT, and we're both learning what we're doing. I had set up the domain controllers, and we decided to put the house on this domain, so we could kind of play around with how it worked. I ended up somehow setting group policies that prevented him from turning off his computer. And to this day, he'll still give me crap about it. <laughs> when I talk about, I, you know, any conversation that involves technology, I've been doing this for a long time, I know exactly what I'm doing. He's like, really, can you, uh, can you set up so I can't shut my computer off still? <laughs> to this day, it's what happens when you're friends with somebody at the beginning of your career. Good times, good times. Not that we ever make mistakes. No, We're, well, we've been perfect experts at this since day one. Well, and that's the whole point about having that test bed that you can play around with that if you do mess things up, it's not a problem. You can easily recreate the environment. You haven't negatively impacted your actual workspace. Yep, and that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm actually working on a VM on another server, so I can break everything I want and I just delete it and recreate it. There you go, there you go. Oh, uh, what's a really easy environment to create VMs in to use and to set up, to easily set up and destroy? I'd say Windows Azure. Ding, ding, ding. There are good VM uses in, in Windows Azure. Maybe a little, it's fun. Yeah, I'd say play with that, give it a shot. Yeah, Windows Azure. You can sign up for a free account. Yep, uh, 30 days of whatever you want. Yeah, get in there, test around, see what you think. Uh, cloud computing, pretty amazing. It Give is. it a shot. Uh, I, I think that's it. I, that's I all we got right that, now. I think that's it. Stay tuned. There's more.